name is Mike Emmer. For those of you that haven't met me in person, very pleased to meet all of you in person. And uh, we're going to get rolling. Today's class is going to go fast. We're going to cover a lot. And my goal with the first part, believe it or not, is to get you out of here and into the field. All right? So the faster we go, the sooner we get to play with actual bees. All right? A few more people come wandering in. That's totally fine. Um, but let's do this. Everybody have uh, the little gift bags? Is everybody kind of poked around in a little bit to see what's in there? All right. Those are for you guys to enjoy. Just little gifts. We're going to use some of that. The big bag of what looks like pet mulch or uh, cedar chips. That's exactly what it is. So in a little while, when we go on break, you're going to take a lighter and that bag of cedar chips. Yeah. We've already found the honey. I see some folks have found the honey. Uh, that's a sample of 2019 uh, spring honey. If it starts to crystallize, which it always does after a while, just put it in warm water for a little while, and it'll turn from crystals into a, a more of a viscous honey like you're used to. Okay, uh, so we're going to start with terminology, and I am going to have my phone out quite a bit. It's totally okay if you guys have your phones out. If you need to charge, Anything. I've got little USB chargers and plugs up here. It's totally fine to come up, plug in. For all adults, you can move around, do whatever you want. It's totally fine with that. I like my classes to be somewhere on the edge of chaos. Right? So, questions? You can do this. If I take a breath, it's fine to insert a question as we go. Alright? Some questions I'll put off to the end. Other questions I'll try to answer on the fly. Okay? We're going to cover a lot. The reason this is actually not called the uh, intro to beekeeping, which is what it said on the back, the reason I call it uh, uh, practical beekeeping is because the intent isn't to get you started so that you buy bees from me. Some of you bought bees from me, some of you have not. Totally fine. It's, it's not the same type of class you have for free and get a sales pitch along the way. All right, we're going to actually learn stuff that we need to learn to get our bees functioning correctly to keep the pests down, and hopefully to overwinter them too. We'll even talk a little bit about extracting them. So practical beekeeping. You're going to learn things today that we're going to apply today that you can take home and apply in your hives. If you don't have bees yet, that's fine too. Anybody here that doesn't have bees yet? Two people? Okay. This is going to be fantastic for you because now you'll get a sense of what it's like to be face first in a beehive. Okay? The buzzing, the roaring. Hopefully, they'll be very calm today, but we're going to knock the lids off of about 20 or 30 beehives back there. So you'll know pretty quickly if you like doing this or not. All right? Okay, so our agenda says to check in on Facebook. Uh, everybody do that? Because we got checked in here. All right, we like to drive social media now. Uh, okay, so. Everybody's uh, in except for a couple of stragglers. Um, future plans that we're going to have other classes here. We will do the traditional get started beekeeping, but we'll do that closer to fall. All right, that'll be a free class where we go over just the very, very basic stuff. We take our time, we learn about setup equipment, show you how to do a few things without any bees around. All right, and that will be a little bit of a sales pitch because you'll be able to decide then. I haven't opened it up yet, but 2021 new orders, I'll start placing those, uh, getting those orders from people when I start doing the intro to beekeeping classes. I'm also going to do uh, classes that will help you build equipment. So if you want to build your own equipment, paint your own equipment, really make it a personalized activity, you'll totally be able to do that. So those are all future classes. We'll also do a couple of advanced beekeeping things. This type of thing I won't do very often. I kind of combine several things to be able to accomplish more of this season, but I just haven't had time to do this spring. So, okay. So you guys know my name. I'll talk about my experience for a little bit. I actually didn't start beekeeping, you know, 40, 50 years ago like some folks. Thank goodness, because I just turned 50. Um, I actually started, I think, seven years ago, maybe a little bit more. And the way I do things, the way I learn is hands on, right? Uh, when I went to go get bees, they were out of bees. I couldn't even order bees at the time. So, lucky for me, I got to spend the first year studying a little bit and learning some of this stuff. I started with three colonies. For those of you who 
they haven't got babies yet. They always want to start with two. Again, I started with three. Killed one my first year. And this is an important concept. We as beekeepers are responsible for our bees. Doesn't matter if a neighbor down the street two miles away sprinkles seven dust around noon during the day and kills our hive. We're still the beekeepers. They're our responsibility. So I killed one of three my first year, which is good. Get you know seventy five percent of what it presented. Uh, some folks aren't that lucky. Going from that to finding somebody, a mentor, that I can work on and dig into hives, face first. I've probably been in several thousand colonies. You know, you can find pictures of me on the internet standing on top of a semi-loaded bees like this. You know, I've got that on my business card. It's one of my favorite pictures. Um, but I think you learn by doing, which is why the field day experience is probably going to be the biggest part. Yes, we can learn what this is. Somebody tell me what this is. It's a D, right? Is it a brood box or a super? Huh? Depends. What's this one? Depends. Yeah, it depends, all right? So a lot of times you'll get on Facebook or something like that into a new beekeeper's uh, uh, group, and you'll say the wrong thing. So we are going to cover a little bit of terminology, right? When I got started... I didn't know that this was called a deep. I didn't know it was called a brood box. I just called it a bee box. Um, this, some people call them boards, some people call them frames, whatever. This is a frame with a plastic foundation. It just so happens it's a shallow frame, which is an odd size. So this is a standard medium. Look at that. These are hard to find. So this is called a shallow medium frame foundation. Compare that to a regular medium frame. See there? Completely different design. This is the most common type of frames to go into medium boxes. And medium boxes are most often used as supers. So that's the first thing I want to cover is root box and super. And it depends, which is, I heard that a couple times, depends on their position, doesn't it? So if this is on the bottom board, you can say in this position, this is a plastic insulated hive. Right? This would make it a brood box if the brood was in here. This would be a double deep configuration if there wasn't an excluder. But if this is honey, even though it's the same size as these deeps, that position makes it a super. All right? So let's do this so that you can kind of see it in this one. This most standard configuration, something like that, right? Brood box, super. Around here, everybody likes to do double deeps. Questions? I was going to ask you, why, why do some people do double brood boxes and then put a super on top of it? Why double deeps and then supers, right? Uh, around here, everybody's addicted to double deep boxes. And part of that's marketing. If I build these boxes, don't I want to sell more of them? Right? So a double deep configuration is the most common. There's no advantage with your, with your colony? There is an advantage, and I'm going to offer a saying to you guys, and this is another good time that if you were taking notes and we didn't have the video going, I want you to write this down, okay? Singles are for food, doubles are for brood, okay? Singles are for food, doubles are for brood. You can actually produce more honey off of a single deep stacking supers then you can a double deep stacking supers. Ask me how I know, right? Uh, one of my mentors uh, has been all over the world doing beekeeping. And uh, he's in his 80s and, and been like countries like Kazakhstan doing beekeeping. It's crazy. And they did all sorts of studies for, um, who, who is the, the, the FDA? They, they have a bunch of studies or whatever. But they actually studied things like wrapping hives for winter. They wrap 500 hives and unwrap 500 hives as a control. Double beeps versus single beeps. Right, so a lot of this is knowledge that's passed on to me by a beekeeper that's done it, and that I've studied it as well. So I've had better survival rates over winter in singles, believe it or not, than doubles. Okay? I'll talk about why in a little bit. So now we have these two boxes here. And we have these two boxes here. What's the difference other than one being newer? What's the difference between these two? This is a 10 frame deep, right? Also a deep box, 
big difference here is it's an a prey version. Anybody here have back problems? Yeah, a little bit. So I do have eight frames we're going to work on out there. I also have mediums. Right? Here's an eight frame version of a medium box. I've got an entire stack of mediums out there. I even have some medium eight frame configurations. So remind me when they're in field if you'd rather work on something a little bit lighter. Okay? Um, all are valid configurations because this could be a fruit box or a super. This could be a fruit box or a super. Eight or ten frame is just how much the whole as far as the fruit. Okay. All right, so that's our start of terminology. We'll hear more as we go. New beekeepers. This may be the most valuable thing your bees can produce your first season. Okay? And if you guys want, you can come up and handle these. I can't hand them to you right now. But this is uh, two pounds of wax. This is 35 pounds of wax. Okay? Um, lots and lots of wax. The reason that that's more valuable to you than honey in your first year is because the bees have to build the wax out from the foundation, or even if you use foundationless, because you can do foundationless. I might pop one out in a minute. But they have to build the wax before they can put the honey in it. Right? you got to buy the fridge before you can stock the fridge. Right? So, getting uh, the wax drawn is critical to your success producing honey, producing pollen. Again, you guys can come up and handle some of this stuff if you want to, but this is worth nothing right now right, as far as production goes. Once it's drawn out, even if they don't fill it this year, this becomes gold. Yes, sir? What is your preferred method of storing that wax? Storing after it's built out so the wax moths don't destroy it. I didn't bring it down because it's super heavy, but I've got a bucket about this size of something called Paramoth. So uh, how many people intend to be as chemical free as possible in their beekeeping? Okay, all right, I'm with you. One exception I make is the preservative for the wax cone, okay? Um, you can take once these are drawn out, and hang them in an area with light, and that'll keep wax moths out. If it's dark, even if you bag them up, put drum bags around them or something, wax moths will find a way to get in there and they will eat and destroy the wax, okay? So either hang them, open air in the light, or even leaving them outside, take the whole thing, right? Because this could be a super, this could be whatever. You set it like that as long as air and light can get to it, it'll actually last the entire winter that way. It'll dry, become a little bit brittle. Once you extract, we'll talk, talk about extracting in a few minutes, um, you, can, you can store them wet, and you can put these paramount crystals, the paramount crystals with it, and what that does is it pushes the air out so the wax moths can't survive. This is very different than mothballs, you know, that you find under grandma's porch, okay? Those are poison. They're bad for you, and the chemicals stay in the comb, right? If I had, um, like if I bought some used comb from somebody, and I knew that there was mothballs used for storage, I just wouldn't buy it. Or I'd scrape it and make them do it over, because that will remain. The paramoth doesn't remain in the comb, but it's dense enough when it pushes the oxygen out, that you need to leave your supers out for a couple of minutes. You just let them air out. Okay, drive them around, drive around in the back of the truck, whatever. All right, uh, I didn't finish by saying, singles are for food, right? Because you can produce more honey, and that's our food. Doubles are for brood, right? And the reason is, I also have these nice pictures if y'all want to see. A double deep configuration like this versus a single configuration like this. All the brood, which is your eggs, your larva, your capped brood, will be in this area of a single box. All right? If you double it, then they're going to do it like this. They're going to build the brood nest over two frames. Okay? So, singles are for food, 
doubles our brood. Okay? When your brood nest is here, it makes it easier to split and make more bees. So we need to decide as beekeepers, do we want to make more bees or do we want to make more honey? Okay? Management style is a little bit different. Imagine if you have a brood nest that's two boxes deep, the size of a basketball in there, you can take this, split it, split it, split it to make more hives. So, singles are for food, right? Doubles are for brood. All right, good? Okay, so let's check our agenda. How are we doing so far? I'm trying to make this part of it really fast. Okay. Hi, come on in. Come on in. Grab a seat. Grab. There's a little gift badge you can go through. We'll make use of some of that stuff. Warm over there. Okay. All right. <laughs> GPS, right? It's crazy, huh? Okay. Um, for my chem-free people, I will talk about integrated pest management. I am not a treatment-free beekeeper, okay? But I will support you and your, you and your efforts to be treatment-free, okay? Um, Chemical-free and treatment-free are two different things, all right? Frame manipulation, technically. When you use your hive tool and, and move frames around, uh, when you go catch a queen, this is a queen clip, right? When you, uh, when you take and make a new, just moving frames around is treatment. There's something called a brood frame. You can call mites. So the strict definition of treatment free is you leave them in the tree where you found them. Right? As soon as we put them in one of these boxes, we're manipulating the bees. Okay? Now there are ways to be chemical free when you manage your, your bees. Uh, I use a combination of things like these are called Apivar strips. I kind of hate them and I kind of love them at the same time. Because they're single use plastic. Welcome, welcome. It's totally fine. You're rolling in. It's, it's good. Um, but these you put in there to treat mites. It's a 45 day treatment. I could drop this in and walk away. That's nice from a labor perspective. You know, it's kind of like doing the laundry. You can do something else while it's running. But this is a 45 day load of laundry, right? So you drop these in. I'm not supposed to handle them bare hands, by the way. And you can walk away in 45 days and pull it back out. Like most treatments, you can't have these in there while you have supers on. If you're going to harvest the honey, these shouldn't be in there. So you got to get your timing, your treatment has to be done before or after. Right? Before the supers go on or after the supers come on. So that takes care of mites too? I mean, uh, high fields? Doesn't do anything for high fields. Mike, is there any type of temperature restriction of this over 80 outside? You shouldn't put that in there. You know. Different treatments vary. Did everybody hear the question? I'm going to repeat it for the camera. Does temperature matter for these? And, and you know, you could go through the directions if you want to. They're tiny. Another thing I don't like about this: very forgiving. Put it in about any temperature. I believe it or not, I have people leave these in there in the winter. That's not ideal, not supported. But you can put it in when it's 50, 60 degrees, you can keep it in there when it's 110. It's fine. Uh, there are other treatments, formic acid, uh, mite away, check mite, that do have some very, very limited windows that you use for treatment. It gets too warm, kills the queen, dead hot, right? Uh, too cold, it just doesn't do anything, right? So, when I talk about integrated pest management, it's not just a commercial for a product. I will do a commercial for you in a second, but I actually combine multiple methods of treatment. Go ahead. Yes. How many different pests? Great question. So, for the camera and everybody else, how many different pests do we encounter? And I'm going to just kind of give you the top three. Okay. Number one, in order of destructiveness to the hive, is the Varroa mite. In fact, it used to be called frequently the Varroa destructor mite. All right? If you uh, want to look some up on YouTube, look up Dr. Samuel Ramsey. He will educate you on the Varroa mite. Wonderful research. Okay? They actually feed on an organ on the bee called the fat body. 
right? And this, I'm not talking like me, but the bees actually have an organ, like we have livers and kidneys. They have an organ called the fat mom. And these mites attach like a tick, and they basically uh, put some chemical in there to dissolve the fat body, and they eat that fat body over time. Now, number one amongst new beekeepers is this myth that I don't think I have mites because I don't see mites. We're going to kill some bees and I'm going to show you some mites. If it takes us all day out here to find mites, we'll find mites. All right, I went out to do a, a video of mine to find mites uh, a month or so ago. Not a one. I was actually disappointed not to find them. But when people say I didn't see mites, they don't understand where the mites are. Because if you can physically see them on top of the bees, your hive is almost as good as dead. I've only saved a handful of hives with, with mites that are phoretic on top of bees. And that's because if you imagine I'm the bee, if you can see them on the back and top of the bee, that means the mites have given up. This colony's dead. Let's get a ride out of here. Okay? Where they actually are is, first of all, they breed under cap brood which is very hard to treat. That's why this is a 45-day treatment, all right? Um, if you use oxalic acid, which is another treatment, you have to do it three or four times to catch the entire brood cycle. It won't do anything under the cat brood. But these things, and I'm gonna show you in a minute, will actually treat the whole hive and the hive meals, which is number two. All right, before I get to that, there's plates on the belly of the bee that articulate, kind of like armor, like a suit of armor. The mites live underneath. That's why you can't see them. All right, to give you guys an idea of context, we all know what ticks are, right? In the Midwest. Imagine a tick the size of a dinner plate on you. Okay? That's the Varroa mite. And constantly feeding, right? So these beastly little things um, introduce other diseases. One, they make the bees weak because they're just feeding off them all the time. It's vampires for bees. Uh, it's a vector for additional disease. It can introduce other viruses. In fact, a little commercial, I guess, for me, I'm participating in a study where we're taking bees and testing them for mites and shipping them off to a lab in, I think, Louisiana or Tennessee, I can't remember. And we're going to check the virus background loads of the bees. Now, I don't have a scientific instrument to check the viruses, but the assumption is mites introduce viruses, viruses kill the bees, right? So you might have bees that can tolerate the mites, but not the virus. What we don't know is what percentage of mites carry viruses. And that's what we're studying. So I'll be doing some control hives out here in the education yard doing that, okay? So you can't see them because they're under the plates. The varroa mites themselves don't necessarily kill the bees, they introduce the diseases that do kill the bees. That is the number one issue with beekeeping. In fact, I did a little survey, non-scientific, with commercial beekeepers. I said, what is the number one thing you'd like new beekeepers and hobbyists to, to do or to know? Mites. Test for them, understand them, and treat for them. Because it's not just about your hives, your hives, and your hives. It's about where your bees go from your hives and what happens. You know, when they're riding on top, they're catching a ride out because the whole colony's going. Guess where the colony's going? They're absconding. You'll see a couple dead outs back there. They're absconding. They'll take those mites with them when they go find a new home next to somebody else's bees. So your bees may be treated, no mites. Your bees may be treated, no mites. Your bees might just be a mite bomb. And now everybody in a three to five mile radius, and then extending out 10 times from there, now has mites again, despite treatment. So you could go from a zero mite count, one or two, two or three, to 50 mites in a matter of a week when you do your mite tests. All right, so that's number one. Number one pest is mites. You've got to control mites. Number two and three, I kind of put on a par with one another. I just happen to dislike small hive beetles more. Uh, anybody here a fan of roaches? Yeah? It is gross, right? One on every hive. Hey, you know, it's whatever. You flip the light on, roaches go, you know, we've got a problem, we treat for it, right? Bees have a similar issue, right? So bees, when they have small hive beetles, 
the high beetle is actually a move at night. And although very, very infrequent, I am convinced that they can occasionally take over a healthy colony. If they come in in sufficient numbers that the entrance can't be guarded, the bees can't keep them out. Yeah. But 99.9% .9 of the time, maybe even 99.999% of the time, it's a weak hive suffering from another condition that gets hive beetles. Because hive beetles show up as kind of a clean up, I hate to say clean up crew, a friend of mine corrected me on this, they don't clean anything up. They just come in and slime everything worse, right? So you can find these little maggots this deep in the bottom of a hive. And it's just slimy in there with these hive beetles, right? So they are a, a far, far, far second or third pest issue in your colonies. When they show up, there's a bigger problem. Yes? Now, do they, how do they arrive? Uh, they like the mite, they get hitchhiked with the They bees? fly at night. They fly on their own. Oh, they fly. Yep, they fly. Right? So if you have a beekeeper that hasn't taken very good care of their hives nearby, and all of a sudden you go from not having hive beetles to <clears throat> hive beetles everywhere, it works kind of like a mite bomb. That's very mm -hmm. rare. Usually, they're just out scouting, and they're looking for them. They actually smell like a pollen in there. They're after a pollen more so than the honey, usually. And in fact, pollen patties, if you guys ever put pollen patties in your colonies, those can attract them as well. But they lay little tiny eggs, they turn into little worms, and then they turn into these hive beetles. And they're armored, and it's tough to get rid of them. And pollen powder? I got, I got, I got some issue with pollen powder. Yeah, yeah, pollen powder too. Sometimes. Now there's a new device developed by a guy named Gloria Keynes. It's called the Guardian Entrance. All right, and again, I can't pass things around, but you guys can come up and look. I've got several. Uh, I'll just open this one too. These are prototypes, actually, that I say. These are 3D printed. What you do is you put these on the entrance, like so, and the bees can come in and out but the hive beetles get confused as the bees are guarding the entrance and they run up inside this groove. So if I put it on here, you can see it will be down at the bottom. And they can, the hive beetles get up in this groove. Here's what kills hive beetles, okay? Full sun, full sun. So when you're thinking about where am I gonna put my hive, those folks that don't have uh, hives yet, think full sun or as much full sun as you can get because they're susceptible to UV radiation and so when they get caught in this little groove, when the bees herd them out, they get caught in this little groove, the sun comes up, they fly away. Right? They fly away or they faint. One or the other. All right? One other way, and I get rid of hive beetles, this is a commercial, right? is one of these. Crazy looking, right? You ever seen, anybody seen one of these? You have, you have, right? This is a thermal port, and I, the name of it's Beehive thermal industry calls it the uh, high thermal system or the mighty mite killer. But this one was used for the first time, and I laid the brand new one out of the box. And it's got little tiny blobs of wax, and you can see a couple of dead bees, and you can even see some mites stuck on this board. So I'm going to leave this up here so you can look at it more closely. But here's the way it works, okay? What happens to us when we get a virus? Get a fever, right? Or a bacterial infection. Fever, it's highly localized sometimes. When you get a scratch or something, you can feel the heat. Okay? Back to bee biology a little bit. When you have a colony of bees, right, think of that as, as our body is the colony. And so what we do is we give the entire colony a fever. So the more things we slide it inside, we hit a button and the computer controls it with a sensor. The sensor sits in the middle of the brood net getting too hot. Too hot sterilizes, too hot kills. We don't want too hot, but 106 is the kill temperature this runs to. 106.01, it turns off. We get a wait until it drops to 106 and then just continue blinking. This treatment, I have a love-hate relationship with a lot of treatments. This is one of them. Two and a half hours. You don't have to babysit it. What you do is you slide it in, put a little reducer on it, you wait until it gets up to treatment temperature, you pull this out, 
and you just let it go. You go have lunch, go work the rest of your bee yard, whatever. Okay? So you don't have to babysit it. It runs on its own with the computer. But two and a half hours. Imagine how many hives he has. Forty. Forty. Okay. So quick math: forty times two and a half hours. Are you ever in a million years going to do that? No. Okay. I did it on thirty. Three times to test this thing. Is that? Was pull my hair out. Single. For a single fruit, or is that for a double date? What are you treating for a single fruit? Is that a single fruit? Rock, or is that a double date for a super dunk? When we figure out the board, I'll answer the question for the camera. White car, white car. White. I think my ducks are trying to run off of your car. Maybe it's the goats or the horse or something. There we go. All right, so the question was, does this treat a single, a double, a triple? All right, can we be chemical free and treat for mites and hive beetles at the same time? Yeah, is the answer. Is it scalable? Probably not. It took a full week to do 30 colonies running two of these boards. And I have power close enough to this yard I can run it. Right? For somebody with one or two, maybe up to ten, works great. And you don't have to use anything like this or form it or anything like this. You guys heard of oxalic acid treatments? Okay, oxalic acid dribble is preferable to sublimation. If you sublimate oxalic acid, you have to use a respirator. You have to use eye protection. You have to use gloves. I'll show you what I have what I use. This is called a Provaplin pin. They make other versions of this. They also make one that looks like a pancake turner. All right, and you can take this white powder. Yes, I have shipped white powder through FedEx successfully. <laughs> but you take this white powder here that'll eat through your gloves, even though it's an organic compound for my chem-free folks. But you sublimate it, which means heats it up between 200 and 220 degrees, and it blows this powder. A lot of people call it fogging. It's not. It's sublimation. It changes the chemical compound from the crystals, the white crystals. It blows that into the hive, and it kills the mites. It'll also destroy your lungs and the mucus lining of your eyeballs. Very, very careful with this, okay? And, and it's kind of funny because it's got a little ceramic lid you put on there and if you don't get that lid on or if this gets clogged up this will explode in your face it'll blow the top off. ask me how i know <laughs> right and if you don't have goggles on anyway so very very careful like silic acid you don't have to deal with any of that if you just give the hive a fever okay remember what we're studying uh with this new study is we're going to see what the background virus load is, not mites. We're not even, we know this is effective on mites. What's the virus load before and after a thermal treatment? Forget the mites altogether, because again, they can tolerate the mites. If the mites aren't introducing disease, who cares? I do, because I don't like mites, but question. Four days after we did that, I did a mite count. Yes. And on both hives together, 26 dead mites. Okay. So. Video forthcoming of a treatment. Uh, <laughs> very effective. <laughs> if you choose to go with an outdoor and you've got the double weeks with no exterior, do you put one in each or just the top or how do you do that? So I'm going to show you how I do the Acrobar treatment. there, but that's just how I do it. Okay? Now, 
follow-on question. Who's wondering, geez, Mike, do you ever do both? Or, or all three? More than one type of treatment? The answer is yes. The answer is supposed to be no, but I, I buy these myself. Nobody gave these to me, so I can say whatever I want about them. So my love-hate relationship with that continues. Two and a half hours of, what do you do, right? So I do, if the mic count is high enough, I do hit them with this, hit them with that, and even oxalic acid to do an immediate knockdown. Because of the mites that that oxalic acid vapor touches, kills 98%. It's not going to get into the cap brood because that's a barrier. It's not going to get into the larva back here. That's where they breed. This heat, heating it up, kills them inside the cap brood. The bees will actually tear down the cappings and can pull out the diseased brood and dump them on the ground. It looked like somebody had a popcorn farting in front of the hive. It freaks people out. Okay? All right. So, world record, highest mite count I ever did. Maybe had a little over 300 bees, 127 mites. Okay? I hit them oxylic, I ran a thermal, and I dropped aquamar in them. I made it through winter. They survived? They survive. That's my personal best. How often and when do you treat for mites? So, how often and when do we treat for mites? In the spring, before we put supers on, in the summer, after we take supers off, and then in the fall, getting ready to go in the winter. Okay, that's how often we treat for mites. If you catch a swarm, Everybody hear that? What do you do with a swarm when you catch it? I consider a swarm a disease. I quarantine them, and I will, if I can get them to stay, which I do most of the time, then I'll let them establish themselves, get a brood nest started, and I will test them for mites. I'll look for deformed wing virus. I'll look for European fowl brood. Guys, you're going to see some sick bees today. I don't mean sick, I mean ill. <laughs> All right, this is my education yard. I brought in every dink I could get from my buddies. You guys are going to see some sick bees today and how I treat them. All right, what do we take when we have a bacterial infection? What kind of medication do we take? Antibiotic, right? Okay. Antibiotic. This is an antibiotic feed, okay? Does an antibiotic help with viruses? Do we over-medicate because we're not aware of this in the largest part? It's becoming more common knowledge. So this isn't going to help with viruses. We think that this does. So we're back to, here we go. How long is this treatment going to last? So, okay, back to the love-hate relationship. We have bacterial issues like European fowl brood, we can treat with this, nosema maybe. Uh, this little deal will help give the entire colony a fever and reduce the entire overall background load of viruses. So even a colony that we've killed all the mites may still have a virus that this can help with. This is a supposition. We've not tested it yet. I'm participating in the testing. We're going to have, I think, I think we have all 50 states now in this study that's going through university. Okay. All right. So now we've covered integrated pest management with some degree of success. The last thing I'll say about this thermal treatment is it scares people. When you see this video, it'll push bees, like almost all of them, out of the hive. It's hot. Right? They go outside and they start fanning. They regulate the temperature inside the hive. <coughs> they like to keep it around 90 to 94 degrees, somewhere in there. All right? At 106, they're all boiling out the front, just fanning like crazy, driving air in. And you need a good convection. You need a lot of oxygen for this because when they're working that hard, they'll burn up oxygen. You can actually kill a hive if you're not careful with too much heat. All right? Uh, but what happens, we use thermal imaging, we can see this, 
what happens is the bees will come out, but they like it. They'll move into the heat stream coming out of the front of the hive, and what will happen with those mites, even the ones it doesn't kill, at about 103, 104 degrees, the mites are sterilized. So the mites themselves will continue to drop for 10 to 14 days after you've done this heat treatment. Now the length of time, blessing and a curse, while you're going like this, you've got to wait until the ambient temperature, somebody asked about temperature treatments earlier, ambient temperature needs to be about 70 for a single or a double deep treatment to occur. So I'm going to answer both questions together now. When it's about 70 degrees outside, which is usually in the morning, middle of the day, that's also when foragers are flying, right? So you might be wondering, well, geez, Mike, what about the bees that are flying? Bees can fly how fast? Anybody know? 35 miles an hour. 15 would be on a, a slow day. That's a big old drone that's full of honey. 35 mile an hour, is that what you said? Yeah. So you're not going to outrun them unless you're in a, a car. <laughs> Um, but imagine if they're foraging in a range of one to three miles from their hive, they're all going to be back inside of two and a half hours, right? They're going to bring home the groceries. So you're actually going to treat the entire hive with a longer treatment, aren't you? Plus they'll move in and out of the heat. You know? So, okay. Uh, double deeps. This is effective. Right? You can't treat a double deep with this, but you end up having to tape the seams. And once you tape the seams, uh, <coughs> the insulation board that goes on top and keeps the heat in. It will kill mites and small hive beetles at the same time in a single deep, almost 100%. Double deep starts to drop off a little bit. Still effective on the mites. Hive beetles are tougher. They'll go up to the top, move the edges, and survive. On a triple deep, I have gotten it to work on a triple deep. It's effective on the mites, but not as. And the hive beetles just laugh. Wax moth? Wax moths, this will help with a little bit too. Because, because the heat I, after we did that, huh? after we did that on my hive, I had six of the little wax moth worms. Yeah. They were tricked on I didn't, we, I didn't, we didn't see anything in there when we opened yeah. it up. Yeah. That's pest number three. That's what's scary. So we've got the Varroa mites. We've got all kinds of ways to treat them. We've got hive beetles. You can put in little traps. I didn't bring any out here. I hate them because they're just little oil beetle traps and they spill and you put diatomaceous earth in and you accidentally kill some of your bees. They're messy. They're not very effective. They work. Swiffer sheets, unscented swiffer sheets put in there and traps with hive beetles. This thing cooks them. You can actually see them run out the front into the daylight. <laughs> which is going to cook them too. All right, hive beetles, you can actually take a couple of frames out, set them up like a teepee in the sun, turn them around after 10 or 15 minutes, and cook the larva out of it. I did a video on the YouTube channel uh, about what Seven Dust did to a hive, and you can see it crawling around in the bed of my truck where I put the frames out in the truck. It just looks like little maggots running around. It's gross. Uh, so number three, wax moths. Cleanup crew is more accurate with them because they'll consume the wax, they'll consume pollen, honey, and they will tear it right down to the bare wood. They'll eat it right down to the foundation. You'll get this webbing, it looks like spiders have been in there, but they'll burrow under the wax and uh, they'll just eat what's left. So if your mites are a problem, or if there's not enough bee population, they go through a freeze, whatever, there's not enough bees to protect it, then high beetles come in and wax moths show up. You put your supers away for the winter and you don't preserve them, there's not enough light, you come back in and you find all of your wax eaten and just crumbled garbage on the floor when the wax moths come in. All right? And I've got a couple of those that I'll show you guys on the way up to the bee yard. Okay, so that's Hive beetles, mites, wax moths, those are the three primary pests. Everything else is more specific than that. You'd be talking about bacteria and viruses. I'm not going to talk about the Latin names of any of that stuff or how we used to keep bees, and, you know, as the, the Greeks and pharaohs did or whatever. <coughs> um, we're sticking with the practical topics here. Okay? Questions?
Poisons. Poisons. So, why are you asking? I don't know. Maybe could we kill the whole hive of bees? Right. <laughs> so poisons. Uh, Roundup bad, right? Well, probably, but not that bad for our bees. It's more of a slow kill. Seven dust will annihilate the colony. All right. But is seven dust bad? No. I'm pretty agnostic about treatments and chemicals. You know, some people just rage about this stuff, and it is bad for you. But if used properly. No problem. So, quick story. Who owns the bees? Who's responsible for the bees out here? Anybody? You know. The beekeeper is what you would think. As soon as they leave, as soon as they take flight from your bottom board, they are wild animals. They are no longer livestock. Which means the neighbor kid at the pool next door or getting an ice cream cone from the ice cream man downstairs that just got stung by a bee, the fact that they know you have this beehive in your backyard or on your rooftop, the question is, how do you know that was my bee that stung me? Right? How do you know? If you have a neighbor that says, hey, I'm allergic. You can't have bees in your yard. My recommendation, not to be overly snarky, is that they um, start doing cardio and get some inside interests, right? Indoor activities are ideal for them, if they're that terrified, right? But if they want to have a reasonable conversation, we'll have that conversation, we'll educate them. I'll put them in a bee suit for free, have them come out here, whatever, to help you have the conversation with your neighbors. The name of my company is Bee Rescue. I want to save the bees, and part of that is educating the people, right? In Johnson, so, in Johnson County, they have a t you have to have your hive uh, a minimum ten feet from your property because of that, because of that flight line. After ten feet, you're not responsible for them. That's why they have that ten feet rule. There you go. See, that's an ordinance that goes above and beyond the state statutes. Uh, buddy of mine had twenty or thirty colonies, and uh, you almost couldn't get in and out of it because it was a pit down into a, like a rock area, and when you'd have a swarm. You know what a swarm looks like. Those of you that haven't seen a swarm, it's worth it to let your bees swarm, as long as they're healthy, just to experience a swarm. But it looks like a tornado going up 30 feet before the bees go out in this particular bee yard. So there's things you can do to manage flight paths and where your bees are. Um, before we leave, I'm going to go there. Okay. I've seen um, some people use all supers instead of deeps, but actually use those for their brew box. Are there disadvantages to that? There are, and we covered most of the types of equipment right before you guys got here. Oh, okay. So this is a medium, which yeah. is typically used as a super, but this can also be used as a brew box, high body, and you'll see in our yard out there, we have both eight frame equipment, 10 frame equipment, mediums stacked, doubles, singles, you'll see the whole myriad of it. We can talk about that out there. Okay. Go ahead. Back to the chemicals. Yeah. Um, I know diatomaceous earth is toxic to certain insects. Is it also toxic to bees? Okay. Diatomaceous earth will kill your bees. And that's because of the way diatomaceous earth kills insects. All insects that have a... Uh, what was that? I use it at home. Yeah, and it'll just annihilate ants or whatever, right? Yeah. As long as it stays dry. As long as it stays dry. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So it will kill your bees. You need to use it carefully in conjunction with bees. And it's because it basically cuts their uh, armor plates or whatever, it, it, and they, it dries them out. So that's why we can actually consume food grade diatomaceous earth. It's not going to hurt us, I don't think. Uh, but those bees, it just kind of dries them out. It cuts their little bodies and stuff. Okay, any other questions? How are we doing for battery life? We've got a little bit of time? Yeah. All right, let me check. Uh, who's, who's got an agenda? You need? So I'll look at my phone. Are you a great time now? Might are, wash. Are we at oh, we're at might wash. Okay, so I was going to have everybody here do a might wash and share some kits to do might washes together. We can't do that. Right? Because of all the whatever. 
So I'm going to demonstrate the light wash here without these. Then once we get to the break, we're going to light smokers. We're going to put our suits on. We're going to go out there and I'll do mite washes with real bees on sick hives. And we'll keep doing it until we find some mites. Because I want you guys to see what that looks like. That's the number one thing uh, commercial beekeepers want. Um, the other thing we mentioned right before you guys got here is this may be the most important, valuable thing your bees produce in the first year. The wax. Nothing to do with honey. All about the wax. Get in your second year, if you have drawn wax, that is such a jump start. Even if you have a hive die out, please, please, if you lose one hive, all your hives over winter, don't scrape all the wax off. Throw them in the freezer, preserve the wax, because that will be a huge jump start for your colleagues. This is two pounds, this is 35 pounds of wax. And you imagine how many hives you'd have to have to just use capping to produce this wax. We have a beekeeper up in, uh, on the border of Missouri and Iowa. His name's Mark, cool guy. Uh, that's where I get these from. He's got thousands of hives. Is it all types of wax, the, the, uh, from the frame, caps? This is mostly cappings from his operation. Oh. Can you imagine how much honey he produces? Like by the barrel honey. So, okay. Uh, might wash. Here we go. Uh, I made these. You can buy them. I'm just going to show you what this looks like, and I'll do it kind of on both sides of the room. We had to spread things out. That looks like six feet, don't you think? Anyway. Uh, so these are just little cheapy little Tupperware things, and I think they work better than the ones you buy. All right, there's a half cup measuring cup in here, and there's a little strainer like you'd use for tea leaves or something. Okay, so what we do is we take a frame out of a hive, carefully. We take that frame out, we look at it, and if there's cap brood on it, brood of different stages, especially if you see eggs, you want to look really closely because we don't want to get our queen in here. All right, I'll show you guys a picture of a queen in a minute. This is what it looks like for a queen mating. Not to be too adult oriented, but there's some bees engaged in adult activities here. Do you have uh, that electronic? <laughs> you have that electronic? I don't. I don't. We can make electronic. All right, should I bring it in? Zoom in a little bit. There you go. All right. So we'll take a frame out. It'll have cold, it'll have all different. And we'll be doing this outside again, so you'll see it. But what we do is we take this. And I'll shake once we are sure the queen's not here. In fact, I may do the inspection further to find the queen, make sure she's over here, go back to this one, and I'll shake the bees off of a brood frame. You want nurse bees primarily, because that's where the mites breed. So I'm going to give it a shake into a tub, that little tub over there. And I'm going to scoop up a half cup of bees. The bees that fly away are mostly foragers. We don't want them anywhere. The ones crawling around confused are like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm a nurse bee, what are you doing? So I'll scoop up half a cup of those, and I'll take that half cup, and I will drop it in here, and I'll slam the lid on it, all right? So now we've got a half cup, which is roughly 300 bees in here, and I've got a mesh that I put on the bottom of that, okay? So I'll show you guys. Uh, Randy Oliver, Follow him on YouTube, scientificbeekeeping.com. That's in the list of stuff that's in your packets. Great information, but he does something like this. And so I'll take the bees, put them in here, drop it in the bottom, so now I have a complete one, and I'll take alcohol and pour it in the top, killing all of the bees. Right, you've seen this a million times, right? So, half cup in the top, alcohol, swish it around. About 45 seconds. All right, once we go with that, we take it out, strain it a little bit. If you look at the bottom of this thing, this one's a little dirty because I've used it a million times, you can see mites, if there are any, down here because when the, they die, it, it releases those plates. The, the mites get knocked off and they flow down through this mesh and you can hold it up and see how many mites. Beginning of the season, 
you want very few mites. Like one or two is not ideal. But you can usually make it with a simple treatment through summer, get your supers on. Summertime, you do another treatment. You get into August, September, October time frame. If you have a mite count above two or three, which is when they skyrocket, the more brood you have, the faster the mites are breeding, then you can tell in October if you have a hive that's going to survive until March the next year or not, based on a mite count. When you have a mite count of like one or two, what does that mean population-wise in the hive? So 300, if you have three, would make it uh, roughly 1%, right? So you want to stay below 1% if at all possible. It's nice to be at zero, which is weird. That's what I was in March when I did some of these hives. We're going to walk past in a few minutes, okay? So were you guys able to see that okay over here? Kind of what I walked through. Half cup of bees. Those are the bottom. Alcohol. <coughs> Swish it around. And then see how many mites you have by percentage. So a half cup is roughly 300 bees. Three is 1%. Six, two percent. You get above two to three percent, you've got a really big problem. Hi there. Hi. You're welcome to come on I, in. I, yes, I am. When you're late, you gotta go to the front of the class, right? Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can come help me teach if you want. We're not <laughs> judgmental. We're we're beekeepers. It's all good. All right. You're all good. Come on up. Where's the mic board for me? Okay, mic boards have their uses. Primarily an academic study of mites. We're talking practical beekeeping here. Do you have mites? Yes is the answer. How many is also answered. Do we treat is also answered. Without a sticky board, without having to go in and count each one. This is a minute or two out of your day. A sticky board is material replacement, study, right? So unless you're doing... Um, fairly in-depth survey of your colony, unless you just have the time and you want to be painstaking and simple with it, I don't use it. I don't use sticky boards at all. Okay? All right. We're sticking with practical things today. Yes? Um, there's a lot of people that I've heard say use the screen boards instead of the solid boards to help with keeping your mind count and your high beetle count down. Okay. Screen boards, the reason they don't work for hive beetles, I'll start with that, is because the, uh, the spacing of the screen board is incorrect. This is, this is one of those, I have to be careful here, because I really, really like the guy that builds these out of Australia. Uh, I got these from an American manufacturer that I don't think follows spec. So you can see they did not hold up well, right? And these are a hundred bucks a pop. Who wants to pay a hundred bucks for a bottom board? Eh, not me, right? Uh, but these little holes in here are the exact, I think it's three or whatever millimeters, the exact diameter they need to be for a small high beetle. Most screen boards are too big uh, or too small, whichever it is. And this tray in here is where we put the diatomaceous earth that the beetles would fall through and get it out. And it'll absolutely wreak havoc on them because this is on the bottom, the bees fall through, go into this, get into diatomaceous earth, and there's just rows upon rows of dead hive beetles. And if you do a heat treatment with it, you'll see rows and rows of mites. Screen bottoms are uh, one of the reasons that hive beetles tend to be so bad in this area. You see what I mean about the manufacturing? This one? If you're going to buy one, make sure it's from Australia directly. I just got the floor all dirty in this thing. Uh, if you like screen bottoms and you think about them for mite count, for mite drop, that's what you'd use with a sticky board. You can see how many are dropping and monitor your population that way. You can also use a, a different configuration, but I don't like screen boards because the ventilation usually isn't an issue. The bees are taking care of it themselves. and the fact that you're seeing mites drop off isn't that helpful. You want to know how many there are so you know if you're going to treat or not. Right? Uh, so, if you would like some screen bottom boards, I have, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them in the sale barn. By the way, you guys know we're having a swap shop type thing after? Right? Everybody aware of that? <coughs> you guys get to see it all before everybody else gets here. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. 
it's not even all out there yet. Ran out of time. So uh, around here, it's like the old uh, commercial pay straight versus less filling. You know, whatever light beer commercial that was. You guys remember that? It's an argument. It comes down to your preference. Okay. I have used both. I use what I have available to me. My preference is, I thought I brought it in here. Uh, my preference is a solid bottom board. We'll, we'll see them out there. Almost everything I have running out there, with two exceptions, uh, are solid or custom solid bottom boards. Okay? All right. Yes? Okay, so this climate play a part in this? Like, where's that? I'm from the Carolinas, which can be much warmer than here, especially in the fall and winter months. Um, does that play a part in how you assemble it? Okay. Everybody hear that over here? Does climate play a part? Excellent question. Um, yes and no. It still goes back to your preference, but the way you manage the hive can be a little bit different in the Carolinas. We do a lot of these in Texas, similar. You get down there where it stays warm during the winter, guess what, you're gonna have to treat for mites more often and hive beetles, depending on the ground, more so than climate, believe it or not, depending on the ground can be a bigger problem uh, than, than they are around here. You go further north, you go up into Canada, and they just pretty much don't even know what hive beetles are unless they brought them in from Georgia or someplace, okay? So climate does play a part, but more so in the technique. It still boils down to your equipment preference. I have left screen bottoms wide open through winter out here, and a mature colony's fine with that. Uh, so they can still regulate their heat with the open bottom. They can because where does heat go? Heat rises, right? Which is why this board slides into the bottom. Heat goes up, and it creates a little kind of a heating vortex, if you will, as the bees move the air around. Uh, so a screen on the bottom doesn't make a whole lot of difference to the cluster inside. And since the timing is good, we'll talk about clusters and overwinter for just a minute. Go ahead. So you don't use green bottom boards for on the normal basis? I do not. Do you vent the top any extra? Sometimes. In, the sun, in July, all of it. Could you guys hear that over here? It was just confirming, do I use screen bottoms or do I vent the tops? And it's all situational with me. I'll use popsicle sticks, pennies, quarters, nickels, whatever, to lift the tops sometimes. But you're going to see a custom top out there. So when you guys, when you're asking me your question, just to qualify, are you talking about this? Yeah, do you assume your your over? Okay. Any? These, to get telescoping lids and inner covers, I do vent a little bit, and I'll put something on here just for me. Sometimes I'm just lazy, and I'll push it back like that, and just leave it propped on the edge. Yeah. But guess how many of these you're going to see in my bee yard? None. Very few. I can't remember if there's any left or not. Go ahead. I see the notch on mine. Is that what they call a top entrance? This is an upper entrance. All right. Not all litter covers have the upper entrances. And the idea, whether it's sitting like this or like this means something to some people, not to me. The difference to me is with a telescoping lid, it doesn't matter. Either way, it's covered, right? See there? So unless you're going up with a super, that's not going to be exposed either up or down, right? Now, if I can find them, I've got an example of an upper entrance protector. It's based off that same Guardian design. Have you guys ever seen beekeepers drill a hole into their supers? Well, the problem is hive beetles can get right in those holes, and it takes more bees to guard them. But you can take the same technology for the Guardian and put it around the entrance and it'll confuse hive beetles. They can't get in as easy. I won't say it's impossible because they're sneaky, but there you go. Telescoping lids are great for the backyard beekeeper. They look the way you'd expect a hive to look. Once you get past, I don't know, 
eight or ten colonies, you probably switch to a migratory loop, which is what we'll see out there. Okay. All right. Any other questions about equipment and stuff before I show you one other strange animal here? You guys see these? Surprisingly heavy. I have customers that have these. I worked with them enough. They do fit regular Langstroth equipment, which again, practical beekeeping. The only thing we're talking about here is Langstroth, okay? That's the style of frame and style we're using today, okay? This is not single-use plastic. I am a little bit of an environmentalist. I don't like single-use plastic uh, if I can avoid it. This is multiple seasons. They say 30 years, perhaps, of use. Insulated lid. This can make a huge difference climate-wise, keeping it cooler, keeping it warmer, okay? I can't remember what the R value of this is, but it's an insulated lid, and you'll notice it's ventilated. So when we talk about getting a hive ready for winter, we talk about ventilation, okay? Ventilation is very, very, very important. More important than, say, wrapping a hive, which is useless. You guys can make beekeeping as complicated as you want. For me, practically speaking, you want to see how I prepare something like this for winter, I try to make sure I remember to put the lid back on. That's it. Okay? You want to see how I prepare one of these for winter? Oops, I forgot the inner cover. I'll go ahead and put it back. Right? That's how I get my hives ready for winter. What about me? I might move this to small. What about feeding for winter? Feeding for winter? So here's what you want to do to winterize your colonies. You want them as pest free as possible. You want the hives as heavy as possible. And you want them ventilated. So when you feed for winter, you're going to switch to a 2 to 1 versus a 1 to 1 solution of feed. I'll talk about that in a second. I've got a visual for you. It won't freeze? Won't, re won't really freeze, um, or if it does, you know, you're going to stop feeding when it starts to get cold anyway, because they'll stop taking it. Um, but you could put sugar and stuff up here, but if you do that, you've kind of already lost the battle as a bee, right? What will happen if you're running a single bee or even a double bee is they're going to stop laying November they're really going to slow down the laying. That brood nest is going to go from, let's say this is the hive, from the size of a basketball or a beach ball, it'll be down to the size of a baseball and then a golf ball. But the bees are actually going to have a different type of bees being born. Winter bees. They're a little heftier, a little fatter, you know? They're going to survive. They're actually going to live longer. The same type of bees are going to live longer because their duties change, right? So when this brood nest gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we want to feed them hard so they backfill the brood nest. Right? So when you get into winter, the hives should be heavy as if they've been collecting nectar the whole time. Even though we've stolen most of it by harvesting, we want it heavy like they have. So the space where they were using for brood in the summer turns into honey and beaver. Correct. Correct. Right? So when I say backfill, it used to be eggs and larva, all that stuff got capped, hatched out, we're getting closer to winter. Let's just pack that in with honey. Let's throw some pollen in there, right? They're just backfilling, backfilling, backfilling. And then the bees during winter are going to move as a unit up and down the frames. So one deep, they can survive in one deep? Yeah. They can survive better in some cases in one deep than the double deep. So, randomly grab, keep grabbing it. You know, here's a picture of a marked queen. If you guys want to see that one up here. But if the brood nest is wall to wall on a deep frame, by winter it may not have any brood at all in it. And the rest of this you want packed with honey. So that cluster of bees. Now, have you guys ever seen the documentaries on penguins in Antarctica, how they stay warm? Okay. They get in this big circle and they work from the outside all the way in, get warmed up, and then work their way back out, and they're just constantly going in a circle similar for bees, except it's a teardrop 
and they move up and down the frames as they consume honey in this teardrop shape. And the ones at the bottom, on the outside, are the coldest. They work their way in towards the queen, who's going to be the heart of this thing. Surprisingly, we've learned small hive beetles will winter with them, too. They've, they've learned to trick the bees into feeding them. Right? The bees used to close them off, propolize them, and trap them. But now the hive beetles will actually stroke the antenna of the bees and like, like the babies do and say, feed me, feed me. And then they trick the bees into feeding them. So, anyway, so there you go. Uh, when you overwinter, you want the bees, the hive to be heavy, full of food. You want them to be pest free. And you want them well ventilated because cold bees will survive, cold wet bees will not. And the respiration causes humidity. You can even mold the inside of a hive. When do you start feeding for winter? I start feeding for winter uh, when we go into the dark or the dearth. How do you pronounce that? Dearth? Darth? Anybody know? Darth beekeeping. <laughs> like the forest baby. I don't know. Uh, when the flow is over and you steal all their honey, you probably need to start feeding. Keep them well fed going into the fall. Once they've, uh, you know, once we've transitioned into the winter season, the days are shorter, the bees are less active anyway. You just keep feeding them until they stop taking it. All right. Now it's time we talk about different types of feeders. I think, and then I think we're coming up on break anyway. We're going to take a little break, uh, hydrate, then we're going to light smokers and we're going to go play with some real bees. That's the exciting part, right? Okay. So this is the top feeder for this fancy type of hive here. And you don't really have to disturb the bees too much to do that. You can just pull this, fill it. This reservoir lets the bees climb up inside. There's a little gap. The bees can go up inside and they drink from this feeder, right? Kind of cool. It's an uh, improvement on this design. This is also a top feeder. By the way, I just had four pallets of these delivered to the sale. <laughs> so a top feeder. But the gap's on the bottom. See that? See the gap there? The bees go up from here, and they stay in the screen area, and they drink the syrup. Right? They work their way down. What's that? <laughs> yeah, a few of them might, yeah, a few of them might uh, like around too. Um, my next most favorite kind of feeder is an internal frame feeder. Okay, sits down in place of frames. It has a ladder. These start drinking up here when it's full and work their way all the way to the bottom. This ladder keeps them from drowning. Sometimes. <laughs> Other times you take this out and it's just full of dead bees. If you do one of those, put it back. So these are not super pro. I mean, they're cool, smart, creative animals, but they're not super smart. Are you guys able to see that over there? Make sure you can see it. This is an internal frame feeder with a lab. I didn't know what you do or do not. Do or do not like this one? I do like this one. You do? Yeah. It's nice because. The bees don't drown as bad because of the ladder. When they do stack up, it's pretty easy to just, even with a glove on, take your hive tool, do one of those. Some guys will put a piece of cork in there, and the bees you know, don't drown as badly. Other times not. Okay? And then everybody hates this kind of feeder. Have you seen a feeder like this? Huh? These are cool. I like them. Like everything in beekeeping situation. You put one of these out with a preservative in it, like thymol, to keep the, the sugar syrup from going bad, and somebody with supers on three miles away, their honey's going to smell funny. They're going to get funny honey out of it. So, very, very selective when you're doing what's called open feeding. Okay? Now, surprisingly, I can take. Eight, ten gallons of syrup and dump it in one of these and lose less bees even than in those other little ones. Y'all seen the little jar feeders that go in the front? 
hate those. They're the worst because they tend to cause robbing and they will freeze and shatter. Anyway, this thing is just a tub DIY and look what's in there. Right? Some little sticks and straw and stuff. And what happens is the bees land on this mat of stuff and they just kind of burrow down in there and they will, it's like sitting on a, imagine your swimming pool, a swimming pool, I don't have a swimming pool. Imagine that pond was a giant margarita and you were floating in it with a straw, right? And if you drank enough of it, the water level would go down and so would you because you're floating on top of it. That's how this works. And uh, you can feed, you know, you put a couple of these out for a couple hundred colonies, right? So if we have a situation like if the bees were really irritable yesterday here, I wouldn't do it now because I got supers on. If we were earlier in the year, just to make them behave better, I put some of this out the day before, and they'd be calm, just knowing there's plenty of food. Okay? Not 100% guarantee. Always wear a veil. Here's my PSA. Just because the bees are kind and nice and happy right now in this moment doesn't mean 10 seconds from now they're on you. They're wild animals, right? So anyway. There's your feeding uh, education. Heard some beeping. Oh, we're good. We're good? Okay. Any other questions before we take a break and start lighting smokers and putting on suits? Everybody got smokers? Everybody got suits? Minimum jackets? <laughs> All right. How about missing one glove? Missing one glove? I got a glove. I can't. I can't. <coughs> we got a lot of beekeepers here. We got extra gloves. And I even picked up a few in Walmart. Okay. Any other questions before we do our break? Let's check our agenda. Can I pour our ears again? All right. How are we doing? We're doing okay. We got to our mic wash a little bit early. I'd say we go ahead and uh, light uh, light smokers and uh, do a little break. Does everybody everybody bring water and stuff to hydrate? You guys all know that I'm not feeding you, right? I mean, <laughs> all right. Those of you that want, I did get some of these waters, and they're all standing upright. At least as of this moment, so you can reach in, grab one, lift it out without touching a lot of other bottles. They're pretty, you know, they had ice in them overnight. You're welcome to those. Can't have anybody passing out for being dehydrated, okay? So let's grab your smokers, and we're going to meet over here in this grassy area, and, uh, and grab your suits and your hive tools, and we'll all get ready to go.